Welcome to Reboot Ideas, The Ten Commandments Rescored, featuring Liz Nord, David Katz Nelson, Steve Berlin, Stephen Droz, and Scott Amendola. I'm Francine Hermelin, the Chief Network Officer and Reboot Ideas Conversation Producer. Reboot is a Jewish arts and culture organization that reimagines, reinforces, and reinvents Jewish thought and tradition to keep them future forward and relevant today. As a premier R&D platform for the Jewish world, we catalyze our network of preeminent creators and artists, entrepreneurs, and activists to produce experiences and products that evolve what we believe is an ongoing Jewish conversation that can ultimately transform society and expand the human experience. With Reboot Ideas, we hope to bring these creators to you to see where our collective imaginations can take us. The potential is limitless. It's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening. Liz Nord is a member of our community, a documentary filmmaker and multi-platform producer who has created and shown work across the globe. She's currently director of content at Sundance Collab, where she develops courses, masterclasses, and learning materials for emerging filmmakers and curates The Muse, a bi-weekly journal for screenwriters and storytellers. So without further ado, Liz Nord, come on and take it away. So good evening, Chag Sameach, to those of you celebrating Passover. Um, I'm Liz Nord, as you now know, I'm a filmmaker, I work for Sundance, and I'm also a longtime rebooter, so I'm especially excited to welcome you to this very special event. Um, as you likely know by now, Reboot has commissioned a modern day score to Cecil B. DeMille's 1923 classic silent film, The Ten Commandments, with some of our most inventive contemporary musicians. Uh, they're all here with us tonight. And by the way, even if you haven't seen the film, we're gonna watch some clips together. So don't worry about that. Um, but before you meet the stars of the show, I am going to officially introduce the star behind the scenes um, who executive produced this whole project. So uh, most of you probably know my friend, David Katz Nelson as the CEO of Reboot, but you may not be aware of his history as a Grammy nominated producer with more than 30 years. How can, how can such a young face have been working in the music industry for 30 years, but there it is. So there really was no one better to, you know, suited to take on a project like this. And David, I will let you go ahead and, and introduce the artists. Uh, thanks, Liz. I want to thank you for taking your time today. You're in New York, so it's getting late for us here in uh, California. It's just about time to have a drink, which means it's around four o'clock. Uh, we're probably a little late. Um, anyway, uh, there you go. Um, it's my uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce uh, three friends and bring them to the stage um, who created this amazing score that goes along with Cecil B. DeMille's uh, epic first attempt at the Ten Commandments, uh, the prologue to the Ten Commandments. So uh, without further ado, because these are the people you want to hear from anyway, uh, I first want to introduce Steve Berlin, a friend of mine who I, all these people I met back in a former life when I was at Warner Brothers. Uh, Steve is in, the, is in Los Lobos, he's in the Flesh Eaters, he's been in tons and tons of bands. Steve, to be honest with you, when I was looking at all the bands you were in, I think I've actually seen you more than I actually knew when I was growing up. <laughs> um, and uh, he's also a producer um, and just a, a constant musician, and it's just, it's an honor, always an honor to work with you, Steve. And he's been kind of, he was the ringleader originally around this, so welcome. Thank um, you, Derek. And then uh, Scott Amendola, where are you? Um, I I was uh, I got to meet Scott when I assigned a band to Warner Brothers called uh, T.J. Kirk, and um, Scott and I became friends, and we've maintained a uh, connection all these years. Um, also, back in the days when there was actually musicians who lived in San Francisco, there was this jazz scene that was coming up, and Scott was pretty much the drummer to go to for the jazz scene. He appeared in um, all sorts of different Charlie Hunter um, trios, duos quartets, whatever it might be, um, as well as uh, tons of others, as well as a solo career. And, and Scott, always good to have you around, and it's good to see you. Thank you. Great to see you. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thank you for coming. Um, and finally, uh, Stephen Drozd, who has uh, been in the Flaming Lips for about 450 years. He's been in Flaming Lips around the same amount of time that Moses uh, was alive, <laughs> something like that. Um, and uh, I, I met Stephen because I, I was lucky enough to... Uh, to work with the Flaming Lips so many years ago. If he's still with us, um, Stephen, are you still with us oh, out there? I am, and um, yeah, I would, actually, I don't think I would be in the situation I'm in, probably without, without your existence, I would not be here anyway. So you were the guy that kind of gave the Flaming Lips their big, it's like, a, you know, the movie version of you know, their big shot. So um, without you, I'm not sure where we'd be. So glad to be here, sir. Well, it, it goes <laughs> both ways. And so, uh, 
it's really just amazing to see the three of you guys, the three amigos on, on this, on this, uh, <laughs> on, on this trip. And uh, without further ado, I'm just going to pass you over to Liz, who's going to take it from there. So Liz, go for it. Well, cool. now that we are all here, um, I'm so excited. I think uh, since not everyone has necessarily seen the film, um, why don't we just start right away with a clip to get a sense of what we're going to be talking about, and then and then we'll jump in. So if you want to get that rolling. That's just at the beginning of the story, of course, we can all tell. Um, and I'm actually going to start with David, the sort of, you know, brainchild of this project, because when we, you know, even when we see this clip, we can tell it's an old film. It's got some sort of antiquated tropes. I feel like I have to start off right away by pointing out that the cast playing the North African Jewish slaves is white. And as far as we know, not even Jewish. So why did you decide that that this particular film needs to be revisited and reimagined right now? First of all, I mean, my first reaction was seeing the slave driver. He looked like he was a guy just fresh from storming the Capitol. I, I mean, <laughs> some, parts of, some parts of this film look so old and then some parts of it. And I think it's partially because the score feels so new and so right, right now, right present. Um, you know, it, it's not that difficult. You know, we we were uh, just, you know, battening down the hatches and going into um into our own little quarantines. And meanwhile, Reboot was thinking about doing a big celebration for Shavuos, for Dawn. And this idea around Shavuos is that this is where the Ten Commandments came to us. And, you know, um, Steve Berlin and I, myself have kind of collaborated. Well, he does, the collaboration works. I ask him if he'll do something brilliant and he will say, um, if he has time to, yes. Um, but we, so we've collaborated in that way, uh, before, um, and I called him up and I'm like, Hey, you know, I don't know what you're doing right now, but you know, we're doing this, this online, um, celebration, this multimedia extravaganza all night long kind of a thing. Would you be interested in, um, in, uh, in, you know, doing a silent film score? He, and, and we've done this before we, we did, Steve put together one. Uh, with members of Captain Beefheart's band and the late, great Ralph Carney. And, you know, back in San Francisco in 2011, we had the pop-up record store there. And so, uh, you know, Steve, and Steve thought, um, yeah, we've got to figure out what, it, what we should do. <clears throat> and, and we went through all these incarnations of what we should do and w w what we should have done was staring us in the face the whole time. I think, Steve, and you, Steve you found it. And, and he yeah. said the only way he would do it is if we could lasso the other two guys <laughs> to be a part of it. That was the only way it was going to work. So luckily the whole thing worked out. But do you remember who, how did we come up? How did we finally figure out that like, of course we're doing the 10 commandments. Yeah, it was, it, it was kind of staring us in the face. I think uh, we had like a long list, but there was like, you know, there was something, there, there wasn't a right choice. There were some cool movies, but there was like something either they were like really long or they were like kind of happy or, you know, like just there was, 
something, you know, something awry with every other choice. And then like, I don't know how I found this one, but it's just like, oh, wait a minute. It's perfect. It's an hour long. It's got, you know, all these like very clear themes. It's, it, you know, it looked like it'd be great. And then uh, I think you went and found out, you know, we, how we could do it, who had the rights, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of propinquity, I think is the word. That's amazing. Ooh, I thought, so I for thought Scott was, and, oh, excuse me. Sorry. I was going to say, I thought it was set stone from way, way back that you guys wanted to do mm -hmm. that. I didn't know that you were for a film to do. That's pretty, it's a great choice for, for the film. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah kind of was. So when Steve and David approached the other two of you, what was your reaction? It's kind of an unusual project. Um, well, I guess Dave and I kind of stay in touch, uh, but with COVID happening, everything being so, what the hell is going on? You know, what are you up to? What are you up to? What are your kids doing? How's everybody doing? And we kind of got into those conversations. And I think by that time, you guys, well, you did know what movie you wanted to do. And he just kind of threw it to me is how would you like to do something with people you've never worked with before? And you might know about them, but you don't really know them personally. And all those things kind of appealed to me being the, being the time that it was. Um, and I wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, so I, I said, yes, it sounded like a great idea to me. And it seemed like it, it was a pretty a great fit from the, from the very beginning. So, but that, it was, that's just how it happened. He just called me up and said, Hey, what are you doing right now these days? So that's it. <clears throat> I actually, yeah. I actually, I actually texted you. And then I did one of those like emojis where you can actually scream. And I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that, but. <laughs> what about you, Scott? Yeah, I mean, Steve Berlin, I think you texted me or called me. You know, you texted me and said, I got this project. And, uh, you know, it, for me, unusual is just sort of the way it's been for my entire life as a musician. So, <laughs> um, And, you know, working, we, Steve and I worked together before, and I've worked with David before. And I was, I played on that film that you were talking about, David, with Steve called me to do that when we did oh, it at right. the pop-up record right. store. That's right. Um, and I've done improv I've done live improvising with silent films. And I've like recently set up a situation where I can record here. So for me it was and yeah, because we we're all just locked down, it was like, of course, you know, if you guys can put up with me, I'm totally down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of the pandemic, what was your process? How were you able to collaborate over space and, you know, not in the same, not in the same place? No, I, I'm, I'm cool with being in a studio with people and, you know, getting a vibe together, but I'm also cool with you send me a track you're working on. I don't even have to talk to you about it. I'll put something on it. If you like it, we'll move forward. And it seemed like there was some of that going on. And there, there was, we had conversations and stuff and we watched stuff, but a lot of it was like, you know, Berlin would put something down and he'd send it out to us. And Scott would, I, Scott and I would both throw ideas down and then we'd just keep moving forward. And I, I actually like working like that, working that way a lot. So it was, it was really easy for me to kind of get into that mode. And um, it just, I, it was just really easy for me. So, and, and fun. Because you're kind of working, there is a time constraint, you know, but you're really just kind of working at your own pace a lot for a lot of the time, you know, so it's great. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the home situation for me is great because I have like all my stuff here. Whenever I go to the studio, I can bring some things, but just being able to just sort of op open that door of like, if I'm hearing something, I can just grab it and get really creative. And, and also, um, you know, we're all, you know, those two guys are super interesting, inventive and um, and open. So I just sort of felt like any idea I had, I could sort of throw and if they liked it, great. If they didn't, great. I just, I'm not, I'm okay with whatever. Um, so I, it was, uh, and I kind of through this whole time being locked down, like, and I've done a bunch of this, you know, just sent, getting tracks sent to me. I like working by myself. I wasn't sure if I was going to like that. I mean, I much prefer to be together, mm -hmm. but it, it like you can get into a, a vibe and a groove and sort of you know, and also we were just constantly communicating on our thread and, and on whatever and just, and, you know, you'd get something and be like, oh, that's so cool, which, you know, and then you know, it was super fun. I mean, yeah, it was really, really fun. It's fun to learn stuff from other people, too, you know, just things that you didn't know about, you know, like Berlin, you showed me that app, that Jesse app, the voice yeah. plugin thing. It's like, I just, I would have never come, maybe I would have come across it, but uh, just uh, just learning stuff like that it's just such a fun process you know you learn something and two days later you're using it for a different project and whatever you know you're learning as you go along was, i felt like there was definitely a lot of that stuff going on with working with video and syncing stuff and all that kind of business you know <clears throat> actually i think the piece i'm missing you brought up the video was how what was the relationship with the film itself 
Were you watching while you created? Did you all watch it together? Like how, you know? Well, you know I, uh, I think that I started it by identifying, like the way that I approach scoring stuff, in what little I've done is, uh, you know, you try and, uh, the way my approach is, it, it, I try and identify thematic um, elements, like stuff that you could use so like when there's a specific character, like they have a theme or this these this group of people has a theme, this dude has a theme. So it, it, it kind of breaks makes the process a little easier to assimilate just because you're not trying to think of the whole thing as a this giant ball of confusion the whole time. So I, I try and break it down into like um, assimilable parts. And so in this, I, there's like a, there's the opening theme, which we reused like three or four in like three or four iterations. Um, there was a Moses theme. There was, uh, I don't know, I think we had, I, I can't remember now exactly how many, but there were like four or five motifs that we would kind of utilize as the characters would enter and leave the, the screen. So it, it kind of, it made it a little simpler because then you're, you know, that musicians, the way we're more or less trained is like, we, you know, we could think of them effectively as songs. So we're, we'd be working on you know the, the Moses theme, or mm -hmm. you know S Scott came with this great the, the the one with the seas party. Like you know, everybody sort of had their you know like we sort of spread the work around. So all right, you do this one, you do this one, and then we'll we'll see what see what we get. But uh, you know, I think one of the more remarkable aspects of it is there were there was almost nothing discarded. Like I don't remember like not using anything. Right? I, did we not use something? I can't. I don't remember. I think we used like almost every idea stuck, which is you know ridiculous on a betting mm -hmm. average level. I mean, there may have been things that were mixed, yeah, things that were mixed lower in the mix or things like that, but I think we pretty much used everything that, that came up. Yeah. And, yeah, you nothing. Said, it's the very first scene with uh, the, you know, the upright bass and that kind of plodding rhythm that the, mm -hmm. the, kind of in pace with the slaves. And it just seemed like we were off to the races after that. Like, oh, this is, you know, how can you, I guess the, the film probably, it didn't have original music, right? I'm going to feel like an idiot if it did. It had no... <laughs> time when it came out so you know you're just you're, it's like a blank canvas but then as soon as you put that that sort of slow kind of menacing sinister bass down it, it was just um it was really easy to jump in on that so yeah. and then giving the character some different uh, you know sounds and textures that gives you some parameters to work in so you don't panic about the whole big thing and that's a good way to start so, yeah well that's a yeah. that's a great segue why don't we oh scott did you have something to add i was, I was just gonna say that steve berlin really organized things well uh, just from a technical standpoint, so we could really just sort of seamlessly jump into things and out of things. And, and he needs, it needs to be said that he really made it work really smoothly. Uh, it's a, you know what I mean? It just it. really, really made it. Really and and I, I just want to add that I was on the text. I was on the text. <laughs> it's called the 10 commandments group. Mm -hmm. And I was on that text and it's like, it literally was almost 24 seven that somebody was working on something and like occasionally it'd be like two o'clock in the morning and I, one of you would say, okay, I'm going to sleep. I'll pick it back up in the morning. And, <laughs> and I was just watching this whole thing happen. And occasionally they, they had a question to ask me as if I wasn't watching. I was, I was reading the whole thing. It was, it was, it was, it was a great plot into itself and, uh, and how it rolled out. Well, I'm sure people will want to know how long did that process take? I can't remember to tell you the truth. How long was it? How long was it guys? Uh, no. But, like a month, I think, mm. more or less, from you know, Monthly. roughly, I guess. Yeah. I think it was. I think it was shorter than you think because the didn't we have to have it on like May twentieth, and we started at the beginning of May. It was, it was like an intense, intense, you know. It was. It was pretty. It, it, it was didn't great. feel like we, you know, I, I didn't feel, you know, I, I felt much more time pressure on other projects. I kind of felt like we had enough time to do what we needed to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was maybe a silver lining of the pandemic yeah no kidding and it was so, early early era pandemic so time was yeah i mean completely my, i'm not sure about you guys but we would be up at five o'clock you know four three o'clock in the morning and then getting up just our hours were so screwed up for a while so while this was happening it, it never felt like a uh, hurry to, to me so maybe it did to mm -hmm. you but i just felt like i was in this weird vacuum where you know, the, my wife was staying home and teaching school from home. My kids were both at home for school. It was, we were just all in this weird zone, you know, so it seemed yeah. to kind of go well with that in some ways. But, yeah. 
Well, we to get back to our characters, I think you you brought up, I love that idea that, you know, different characters have their sort of different soundtracks. And of course, our other main character is Pharaoh. So why don't we watch a Pharaoh clip, a major Pharaoh clip, and talk a, and chat a bit about that. So, yeah, wow, I was right. So this is, of course, when the, the firstborn sons of Egypt were slain, including Pharaoh's own son. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about your approach to this very weighty section? I do remember that Scott started this one. Yeah, Scott came, Scott had that riff. The bass line and the drums there, yeah. The bass and the drums. And I remember the funniest thing, I think, I'm not sure, I think you had the bass line first. And I heard it, I heard the one on the three. Mm -hmm. So, th so for some reason, I had it in my head like totally different, and then, like you put the drums, so I was like, "Oh yeah, of course!" Like it, <laughs> it did, it didn't make it. It made it, it made sense either way, but I remember hearing it kind of like kind of upside down when it, when you first sent it. It was like, I mean, it was cool, but I, I it didn't like I couldn't get quite get my head around it. Then it, I just remember like, God, what an idiot! <laughs> like, <laughs> like how could you miss one? Not at all. <laughs> uh, Scott, do you remember what you were thinking? Like. Watching that stuff and coming up with because it it does it, it sounds evil you know there's an evil that's yeah and that's it you know I was sort of just sitting watching and I don't play the bass and I I mean I have a bass and a really nice amp here that Charlie Hunter's left at my house so um, I'd mess around with it and I you know I I around with it every now and then but um, I was just hearing this riff so I kind of actually first went on the piano to figure it out and then I grabbed the bass and and uh, um, yeah, I mean, I was sort of, it's like Black Sabbath Band of Gypsies, kind of like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's just exactly like, it. One of my favorite Sabbath Band of Gypsies. One of my favorite <clears throat> moments. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I love that I was one like, too. And I was like, are these guys good? You know, like you just, I mean, I just wasn't sure how everybody's going to feel about it. And they were like, yeah, this is great. So then I think, I, yeah, and then I put the drums on. So I think, I, yeah, I sent the bass line first. Yeah. Just yeah, you sent the bass line and then, and, then and then the drums, which was great. I mean, and then I put the, oh, the that's a MIDI sax. It's a toy that uh, Casio made for a while in the early 80s that I like to noodle around with. So uh, I'd like to have a separate conversation of how it converts breath and all that into information that turns into digital information. That, that's just a crazy instrument. It's just that a is. little, oh, it's not on my desk anymore. Um, it's just this cool little toy that I love to use as much as I can. Ripping. <laughs> That's cool. See, this is the kind of BTS behind the scenes material we're here for. Right. Is there are there any other cool toys that you all got to play with during uh, this project? Um, this is my usual stuff, really. Nothing, uh, nothing too crazy for me. A lot um, of so software stuff, but it, like, there's you know, the, none of that stuff. It's all crazy. <laughs> Some, mm -hmm. you know, software synthesizers and uh, you know, samplers and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, the Pharaoh scene with that with that bass line, it's got like the diminished fifth, you know, doo, 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 whatever you want to say there. But that, I think that really suits the evilness of the that damn Pharaoh, you know. Mm. It's yeah. also it's also the first scene of the film where it's colorized. 
Mm-hmm. Too. So, you know, you have that heaviness and all of a sudden that fire just pops out and it's just it's crazy it's, looking. It's crazy looking. It really is. It's insane. Yeah. Wonderful. And it's, it's definitely um, red, you know, for a reason it's, it's, maybe fire, maybe blood. And, and strikes me, it's such a violent story from the very beginning. We've got the whippings in the first scene. We've got the death of Pharaoh's, uh, you know, son. We've got people drowning and people, you know, warriors chasing slaves. I mean, it's all so intense. How did you decide sort of where to put, like, push on the gas for the, the score and where to pull back? I don't know how to really answer that. I guess it's just a feeling, you know, I think you just go on instinct. I, I, I wouldn't want to speak for all of us, but I don't think any of us really over analyzes any of it. You just, you're watching it and you get a feeling and you kind of go with your feeling and you hope that the other guys or whoever kind of get, get that same thing, you know, but I would say that's pretty much how I approached it. You know, I just yeah. watched it. And yeah. whatever I, got, I tried to uh, express that in some kind of musical way and <laughs> move on from that. I think, I think that's what I alluded to earlier in the outline part. So I would try and identify moments that were thematically more or less unified. So you it wouldn't go like super heavy to super light. You know, like you, you kind of want to stay within, especially when you're doing it like this, when we're not actively scoring. Like, you know, I've, when I've scored movies, there are scenes where they go dark light, dark light, and you got to sort of bounce around. But um, in this one, you know, we pretty much every every scene that we chopped up had a thematically unified feeling, be it dark or light or heavy, you know, like it, it kind of just worked out that way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Glad yeah, you all I mean, agree. Yeah. Well, so let's, let's fire up another one. And this, this is, this is another one where color is introduced, but in a whole different kind of vibrant way, the, uh, the Exodus scene. Oh man. hear about the the themes of Passover and how, you know, they relate to music. So in this scene, we're escaping from Egypt and music has this universal representation of freedom. Uh, I was wondering if you had actually, you you talked about the characters as sections. Had you talked about any of the kind of Passover themes? Did they play into your work at all? Uh, Not really. I don't think, to be perfectly honest. Um, You know, I think we were just really focused on the art. I don't think we got into any deeper thematic uh, discussions. I mean, perhaps had there been more time, we might've delved into that, but I think, uh, you know, we just kind of hit the ground running and went after, you know, just trying to 
get something that felt cool. Yeah, like I, the slaves running through Egypt. Yeah, just uh, I, I agree. Just the the visual of that. There's so many ways you could go that that, w- that could be right, you know. But uh, I like the kind of the that choir sound. It reminds me of uh, I don't know Werner. What's his name? Werner Herzog that did the a mm-hmm. movie or whatever. Yeah, like, Gary Wrath of God. Yeah. That kind of um, heavenly goth kind of all at the same time. Definitely going for that. But to go back to what Steve said, I I don't really know a lot of the deeper stuff about about it as a as a gentile. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But yeah, just again, going on the visuals and man, it's just, it's, this stuff looks incredible. I was just kind of going on that. So I'm not sure if I really added to the conversation, but. No, but I'm I curious, mean, was there anything about the visuals there in that scene that kind of really got you going? Well, that, that crunch sound too, David had mentioned, struck him. Yeah, I that's, mean, I was gonna... it felt like, it felt like people plodding along in, you know, right. in, in, in a, uh, in, in almost like a death march, almost kind of. Yeah, you know, Steve's had that from the very first scene. That's the very yeah. old theme yeah, sound. So that's, that's a sound that we kind of brought back, you know, more or less through the whole movie, you know, just the yeah. side of people marching. To me, it implies yeah, I mean, I'd say, suffering, you know. I mean, I think from the visual aspect of having how we work, just like, the way that it's affecting us, it's not, you know, it's affecting us on some kind of emotional level that we're reacting to. So in a way we are sort of thinking about that story subconsciously somehow, you know, sometimes there's a, you know, there's a little bit of consciousness around it, I think, but, but I think, um, uh, you know, we're seeing this and we're just, you know, so I think that you could say that aspect of it. And I was going to also say that, you know, we're all very orchestral. So Mm. um, the, the music, like, would get can get so big and wide at times and then it can get smaller and I, that was a really exciting thing ab- about this for me just hearing how where things can go and where they get placed and um you know whoever's idea came in and and then how it would get mixed or or um just hearing it and thinking like oh well, i wonder where that's going to go later you know um just we're thinking in layers and um you know you see this scene with like all these people marching and you know and and it's just kind of powerful and you know mm-hmm. you see the, little, the the kid you know it's like all these things like really i think struck us on a strike you on a certain level when you're really in tune with what's happening and i think that's really what we all react to you know and i think that in that sense yeah one, really good depth. You know, one of the uh, one of the things i really like about this scene in particular is you know it starts with the the sort of death march crunch plotting sound and then the drums the, the drum kit you put in it's like double time of that so it's like oh we have motion happening you know mm. the, it ups the ante on on the rhythm and the motion and that really i just it re- it really that's uh one of my favorite things about the whole sorry one of my favorite scenes of the whole movie is that combination of the suffering the slow stuff and then the drums kind of give it this more uh, it just sounds more modern all of a sudden you know what i mean just that thing coming in it sounds more modern and you have the sort of gothy choir and the gothy stuff all mixed together it's um it's a pretty pretty great mix for that scene i think it sort yeah, of epitomizes like, the project yeah well there's like the loop that steve had going on and then i come in with the acoustic drums later so there's this like a layer of like modern and like you're saying which is really cool nice work if you can <laughs> <laughs> also, Scott, I think you know you're, you you were getting to something that all of us who grow up in a Judeo-Christian society do have some of these stories kind of internalized somewhere in there, you know, some of these details. And it's interesting that you brought up that thing about narrow and wider, because probably, you know, you may not know that, that in, in Hebrew, in, in the Hebrew telling of the story, Egypt is called Mitzrayim, the narrow place. And the Jews are escaping the narrow place and going out into the wider place, into the desert. So without even really knowing, you actually somehow you you got that and p- were able to put it into the music, which I think is so cool. Um, shall we look at another scene? And I also just I want to mention to those of you at home, feel free to throw some questions in the Q and A because we are nearing we're nearing that time. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen that says Q and A, and you can type. Uh, questions in there which we'll throw to our artists but in the meantime uh want to do one more sure yeah sure yeah
That's true. <laughs> Sounds like you're ready to go, Stephen. I don't even ask, have to ask a question. Oh, yeah, that was that was when we tried tried to specifically have sa- like sound design in this one. You know, where it's musical, but the images and the sounds are actually coinciding each other. It's a little more labor intensive, but I think it's it's worth it in the end. You know, that's uh, it's just really fun to watch, and that's that's all I have to say about it. I remember working in, intensely on this one for for a little bit of time. So I think we all did on this one. But we reused that initial theme, like the first thing that you showed, it was like, it kind of came back, you know, we sort of tried to complete the circle, um, different groove, but the similar melodic flavor. That original half step of walking. Yeah, Yeah, just a simple half step thing. And when you, when you, when you get that, it makes it easier to just, oh, we've heard this and we're going back to this and we kind of know what we could do with it. And it's, that really, really works well in that way. So, Yeah. And that, that's Theodore Roberts as Moses. And I just need to say San Francisco native. Uh, <laughs> and and Theodore, shout out to him. Theodore Roberts. Nice. He was Good. in dozens of Cecil B. the Mill films. In fact, when he died, um, he really didn't like his family very much. And he pretty much left everything to a nephew and to Cecil B. the Mill and Cecil B. the Mill's brother. For, wow. for, <laughs> uh, Who knew? Like Cecil needed anything else, you know, from <laughs> right. Wow. I have another question about that section. What, what struck me when I watched it is this is where Moses is talking to God. And I thought as a musician, what a, what a challenge, like, how do you decide what God sounds like <laughs> there? Uh, it sounds like a Mellotron, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it was written. <laughs> It's funny because I've always known that, but no one's ever right. said that, you know? I mean, a Mellotron can conjure up, you know, God pretty, pretty, uh, yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> Especially in the choir setting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so David mentioned, I think you all are working on an, another project together. Is that what we're talking about, David? The Gollum Project? Yep. Well, yes. you know, the real reason we have you guys here is because we're trying to check in where you're at with that. It's a little... <laughs> no, we're, we're really I was late. set up. <laughs> we're really <laughs> late is where we're at with no, that. So <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, we, I, they're on this, the, the text, the text group still exists. And like once every week or two, one of you guys will be like, hey, when are we doing this again? You know? <laughs> well, so, I think we all agree that my schedule is, is getting free like now. So uh, the lips have been yeah. doing stuff we've been playing these shows in oklahoma city these crazy bubble shows and that's been most of my time but uh we're gonna do another one but that's gonna slow up so i'll be a lot more free here coming up very soon so yeah well why don't we tell our audience what this project is is about they're probably more interested in that than in the logistics of your arrangements <laughs> oh, i don't know i want to go to oklahoma and see the show you me, know? Too. <laughs> me too so folks in case you didn't catch all that there's some live actual live music happening in steven's world which is pretty cool trying to do it without you know being insensitive to because this COVID thing is it's so destructive but we're trying to do we have been doing these concerts where uh, all the participants are in their own space bubble that's sealed so uh, social distancing is is key and we're also in space bubbles so uh it's gimmicky but it's it's we think it's safe and it's been a lot of fun <laughs> so there you go <laughs> how, how do you clean the bubble when they're done uh our, <laughs> we have three guys after the show that disinfect every every bubble wow, that's it's a, lot, a lot of wow hard. yeah we have some guys that work really really hard so yeah after every show they're completely disinfected and if you get the bubble and you buy the ticket they fit I don't want to talk about promote our, our stuff, but <laughs> three or four people can fit in a space bubble and you and your party, whatever that is, you get in and you get towels, you get waters, you get uh, a sign on one side that says, I need fresh air. The other side says, I need to pee. And if you <laughs> to pee, one of our crew unzips you, they're in PPE completely. They no let you way. come back and uh, if you need fresh air, they open up, unzip it, p- pump a bunch of fresh air in and zip it back up. And that's... wow. Wow. I predict I'm going to have that sign in about 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is too cool. What a moment we're in. Well, David, was there something before, you wanted to say about, about Gollum? Gollum. Okay. Before we talk about Gollum, I just want to say that the soundtrack will be available on vinyl. Um, the Ooh. artwork is being finished up. And uh, given the fact that, uh, you know, mastering and manufacturing is so long for vinyl right now, because actually during this pandemic, there's been a, a surge in people buying it that'll probably be another six, seven months before it's out, but it's, it's, it'll come, it'll come before Hanukkah. So there you go. 
Um, Isn't that meanwhile, wild? What? It's just wild that that's the situation that because of the pandemic, <clears throat> the final yes. is backed up. That's just, that just seemed, it's just crazy. I mean, it's just yeah. really. To me, so. You can't even get boxes to ship LPs in. Yeah. Wow. Such an, there's such a, there's such a, um, a rush for it. Um, but meanwhile, June, the month of June is the 100th anniversary of the theatrical release of this film called The Gollum, which is, you know, for all intents and purposes, the Jewish Frankenstein. And um, basically the uh, the way that we're going to be dealing with it is we're going to cut the piece, the, cut the film up into six to eight different pieces and have different performers do new uh, scores for each different piece. And we're going to serialize it and talk deep about the occult imagery that's like baked into it and the whole thing. And um, these guys are doing one part of it, which I'm, I'm so thankful for, you know, Aya Matsuka from the boredoms is going to be doing Ooh. one and, and Robert Morley from the dead sea and uh, universal eyes, which are a member of wolf eyes and slumber party you're doing are doing one. And it, it goes on. We have uh, a, t- a ton of great artists that are signed up to do this. And, uh, and I'm very thankful to you guys doing it. Uh, in fact, I do believe you guys are the final scene. You guys are the climactic yeah. oh, wow. you know, thing of the whole thing. Well, they're experienced now. Yeah. So, um, well, with all these thank yous going around, uh, I think we're, we're kind of wrapping this up. So folks can be looking out for the soundtrack in a few months. And meanwhile, the link to the film is is out there on youtube it's uh, on the page you registered for this event on so if you haven't got to watch the whole thing it really is a trip um it is. It's a and trip. we're so grateful to to all of you for participating during this weird time and for participating in this call and um i have been asked to throw it back to maddie from reboot who's going to to take the reins from both tanya and francine it's a power powerhouse of ladies back there um, David, is there anything else you want to add or, or well, I, say I to this I just want to thank artist? you. I know how busy you are with all the things you're doing. And, you know, to, you know, just let you guys know, Liz and I have known each other for a while. And we have our first conversation was around music and film. Uh, th- those are, you know, in fact, she was doing a, a documentary about about music when we, we met. Um, so it really, you know, brings it together. It's so great to have you here. And obviously, it's just great to see all my old friends who I just I have such a big esteem for and just love the work and just love being able to talk to you guys. So it's great. Thank you yeah. bring it all together. Cats Nelson. You, you really do. Yeah. It does make it cool happen. People, you make it happen. So, um, yeah, you got to watch that. You should watch the film. You got to see the parting of the red sea, that whole, uh, that's, that's wild. In the end, I call it the Burning Man scene. It's totally wild. Um, so, so yeah, we that the next Burning Man. So, sorry. We hope everybody stays healthy and well, and uh, listens to good music and plays good music. And and here's Maddie. Thank you so much.